call this meeting to order, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. I am Mr. Lamin Bidiba, Minister of Environment, Climate Change, and Natural Resources of the Republic of the Gambia. I am tasked to chair this uh, session organized by the International Institute for em uh, Environment and Development and both ends. So today, <coughs> we are discussing on delivering money where it matters, effective climate action through predictable local climate finance. And um, the format of the session would be, I would just give an intro introduction to the points, and we have a panelist of presenters. But before the panelists come in, we have the keynote speaker who would um, deliver his keynote address. Then the panelists will come in to talk on the various points. Um, as we all know, least developed countries are the most vulnerable to climate change and lack the resources needed to cope. But we are also leaders with great ambition. So in the rest of the world, how to shift to a low carbon climate resilient development pathway. However, <clears throat> we are being left behind as least developed countries on climate finance by both private and public sources. The poorest countries get just 5% of the public finance for their energy transformation, despite possessing the most urgent new energy needs. And just 40% of adapting funding, despite being prioritized for the poorest, and less than 10% of the climate finance is committed to reach to local level. And this is very important because here all our efforts is geared towards making our local communities resilient and enhance their adaptive capacities to mitigate the effects of climate change that disrupt livelihoods and economies. So this is very important for us to reach out to the local communities to enhance their res resilience. <coughs> we therefore need ways of getting climate finance flowing to the poorest countries and down to local level who are in the front line. And the good news is that funds are available. We have them. But how do we access them? And how do we prioritize our climate actions to touch the life of the people in the communities? How do we get our actions in line with our national development plans to achieve the Millennium Development Goals? These are important linkages that we need to put together as least developed countries. When we look at um, technology, we require technology to be able to do uh, climate actions. But also, we require capacity development. Because as I said earlier, we are at different levels. We are at different levels of development, but also resource availability, we are at different levels. So it is important for us here to discuss how do we get this down to poor countries, but as well, how do we get to our communities? So today, we will hear from subnational governments and non-state actors in the North and South who are demonstrating how they are part of the solution. Subnational governments and non-state actors can engage communities because we all know non-state actors, most of the non-state actors are the people who live with the people and know their issues and can provide 
solutions that are socially acceptable and economically viable. So this is a very good um, movement to reckon with in our action marching to climate resilience in our communities. <coughs> Subnational governments and non-state actors can engage communities at the front line of climate risk because we all know in poor countries, the poor and the communities in poorest regions bear the brunt of climate risk. When it comes to flooding, they are highly vulnerable. But because of their poverty status, they are also vulnerable because they do not have the resources to put up structures that would resist even the mild wind blowing so that their houses can be strong enough to resist, but also how do we make them to ensure that their economies at local level are also buoyant to support the process of climate resilience. So it all boils down to livelihood. When we enhance their livelihood, they are able to, to support themselves, galvanize support around themselves with the support of the local people themselves, the donors, and their national, subnational governments. And uh, at the front line of the climate risk <clears throat> to respond to their priorities and enable distributed climate action at true scale and impact. And when we find effective approaches, we need to learn from them and quickly replicate what works. So here also, we need to know what actions to take and what works where, because we are all operating within different socio-cultural and economic context. Sometimes something that may work even the two nearest neighbors. What can work, for instance, between Senegal and the Gambia? We are neighbors, but sometimes due to culture, due to our economies, uh, the context may be different, but we have to learn how do we adapt it to our context to make it relevant and work. We also need to communicate the, different, the difference that climate finance can make to communities at the front line of the fight against climate change when it is done well. So we can demonstrate the value of this finance to the cynical and the skeptical voices that questions its values. So we look forward to hearing from the panel about their practical experiences uh, in developing innovative climate finance solutions, building the mechanism that will get money where it matters, and how climate finance um, can and must evolve to deliver sustained, predictable, and regular climate finance to sub-national levels that will enable us to deliver the Paris Agreement in ways that make a meaningful difference to the most vulnerable communities. On that note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to introduce the keynote speaker and the panelist to take the floor. To begin with, um, I'm inviting Eva, um, Eva Svendling, the State Secretary to the Minister for International Development, uh, Cooperation and Climate, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sweden, to deliver her keynote uh, address. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, distinguished guests, representatives, ladies and gentlemen, friends of a sustainable future. The impacts of climate change, such as extreme droughts and floods, are primarily felt at the local level by women, men, and children. Therefore, climate change adaptation actions should also take the local level as a point of departure. 
Looking at climate finance flows globally, we see that not enough is directed towards the most vulnerable countries and that climate adaptation is an underfinanced area. Sweden takes climate change seriously, not only in our domestic climate uh, change measures, but also when it comes to providing international support for climate action. In 2016, Sweden provided more than uh, 3.8 billion Swedish crowns in climate finance grants, with, with countries and organizations on the African continent being main recipients together with global organizations. Almost 50% of Sweden's climate finance was directed to adaptation action, 15% was aimed towards mitigation and around 40% finance initiatives with both adaptation and, and mitigation objectives. Another significant challenge when it comes to distribution of climate finance is to shape climate finance to reach the most vulnerable communities within countries. While national level policies and structures are necessary to protect citizens from climate change impacts, there are also the need to support approaches to decentralized management of climate finance and, and enable local participants in decision making for how to manage climate risks. As an example, Sweden is highly decentralized and the main responsibility for climate change adaptation risk management is at a sub-national level. The local, the local knowledge and ownership is absolutely essential in order to develop relevant and efficient risk management and adaptation measures. This is not the least important in order to avoid maladaptation. Hence, with a high level of local ownership, we will also get a better use of the limited financial resources we have on hand. In order to take meaningful and, sus and sustainable climate change action, there are certain prerequisites that need to be in place in terms of technical and institutional capacity, funds, access to climate information, and community participation. The CEDA-supported organization IIED, which is organizing today's event, has many years of experience from how to make decentralized natural resources management work in practice, including in the Sahel. Building on those experiences, the DFID and CEDA-funded adaptation consortium in Kenya has provided significant benefits for people in poor and marginalized households in the most drought prone regions of Kenya. Key factors that have been contributed to these uh, interesting results and that are, that are all interconnected are local climate adaptation planning, decentralized climate change funds governed by local legislation managed by local government, uh, government authorities, local communities decide which investment uh, the funds make, climate information services developed in consultation with, with local users. It is evident that climate change impacts women and men differently, and, the, uh, and that women are often underrepresented, although they are positive change agents that cr uh, with cl crucial knowledge and experience that can ensure success of an intervention and its long-term sustainability. Therefore, in this context, it is essential to ensure uh, that local climate finance solutions actively address gender equality and also promotes the strengthening of women's voice in decision-making. Predictable and sustainable financing of climate change adaptation cannot solely rely on external resources but should also be drawn from national and or local budgets. Local ownership is also likely to increase as funds are allocated from the local budget. It's encouraging to see that this has a high priority in Kenya, where, for example, Makueni County has managed to allocate 1% of its budget to climate change action. Finally, Sweden is pleased to be a partner of Kenya IIED and the Adaptation Consortium. We look forward to continuing, uh, continuing following your work in the coming years. We also hope that other actors will learn from these experiences on how to decentralize climate finance, enable local decision making, and thereby shape relevant and efficient climate action that leaves no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva, for that insightful 
uh, keynote address. And I do not want to recap what she has said, but I believe uh, we all understand what she was talking about, making it available, but also to the grassroots. We know the people whose life and livelihoods are impacted, women, children, men, who are vulnerable at our communities. How do we make climate and mainstream climate into local, local development planning? This is very important. So I thank you very much for that uh, statement. Next on our agenda, we will, I would want to introduce the panelists who are going to give their, their experiences um, with regards to climate financing. <coughs> the first panel speaker uh, is uh, with, the, with insights from the United Republic of Tanzania, Dr. Lucy Sendi from the President's Office, Regional Administration and Local Government. So um, she would give us her thoughts on climate financing. I know coming from local government, you will give us insight from subnational government. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the United Republic of Tanzania, and I'm here today to share the experience of implementing the decentralized climate finance uh, mechanism. Uh, this is a mechanism that uses the uh, decentralized structures uh, to get the uh, climate funds uh, from different sources, such as multilateral, bilateral, government budgets, etc., into the hands of uh, local governments. And these funds are in turn used for uh, uh, investing in projects uh, that help communities to address the uh, impacts of climate change which they experience in their daily lives. Uh, in our ministry, currently, we are working tirelessly to review our policies and guidelines and also to strengthen our mechanisms so that we can fit with the rigorous processes and standards of the Green Climate Fund because we think that by being accredited to the Green Climate Fund, will be able to uh, access these funds and then using our architect, channel them to local government authorities. Uh, it is not easy. We've been working uh, in this process for now about a year, but we are getting there. Uh, this mechanism, I think, is one of the mechanisms that ensures that uh, communities are assured of sustainable and predictable uh, funding, as the previous speakers have already said. And we think that for countries like Tanzania, uh, where our economies are still growing, using a decentralized mechanism ensures that the funding uh, reaches the most vulnerable, the ones which really need these fundings. And I think that uh, other countries uh, will learn from countries like ourselves in Kenya and also Mali where we are implementing this uh, uh, mechanism and try and uh, channel more funds to the local levels. I know it is not an easy thing, but together we can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lu Dr. Luzi, uh, for sharing your actions on decentralized, decentralized climate financing mechanism. Um, the second panel speaker is uh, the, with insights from the United States regions, um, Bob Wakowski, state senator of California. And uh, California is a peculiar state uh, with regards to climate, uh, climate financing and climate action support. Because um, um, is one of the states in the US that is talking about decarbonization of their economy. So, and I think California being one of the biggest economy, I think eighth economy of the world, is something that we need to share, you need to share your experiences with us. 
you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Minister uh, Dibba. Uh, first, I'll apologize for the United States not participating in this conference. <laughs> I understand the pavilion is going to have a discussion on coal. Uh, it's it's uncomfortable being here fr from a country where you don't have any representation. But we'll do the best job we can at the sub at, at the subnational level. Um, so. Uh, a little bit about our attention in California. We've have, we have a suite of, of bills and laws that provide us with our, our climate uh, agenda. A lot has been discussed about cap and trade, and my governor is here and he's talking about cap and trade because we create about a billion, about $2 billion a, a year, or we anticipate we're gonna get that, that we can spend on different programs. Um, but that only accounts for about 17 to 20% of our, the reductions that we have. So we have 80% of our reductions in the climate come from other, other sources. And that's, that's a concern as we look at, at, at these different programs. One of the uh, elements that California has done is we've identified disadvantaged communities within our, within our state. We have a enviro screen that we've gone in. We've looked at because of black carbon or being next to the ports, the pollution that's there, or just the, uh, uh, the greenhouse gases that are emitted in their different regions that we look at um, different, different programs require that 25% of the funds be uh, spent on these disadvantaged communities. And sometimes within those, within those disadvantaged communities, we have to employ the people that, that live there. So while it may not be the same as a, a poor pre person in Tanzania that's impacted, you're still by a port, by a freeway, high incidence of asthma and other ills that, that, affect, that affect your health. So in a, in a picture, we're, we're working on that. Within our cap and trade program, so we try to put a price on, on carbon, we have various programs that are designed to assist in uh, local uh, uh, governments uh, developing the plan. We have uh, specific money that goes into uh, transformative climate communities and uh, technical assistance for community groups. So we have this idea that we have to provide technical assistance for um, uh, different uh, groups. We have, you know, we are originally, our climate uh, agenda was 100% mitigation. So we recently uh, uh, approved our uh, cap and trade plan, so some money will go into uh, adaptation, but all our money went into mitigation, and it's an important uh, uh, element, but we realize that California is an emitter of about 1% of the, the uh, world's carbon. So there, there's value when people are looking for different uh, financing, and, but also information on the at adaptation um, uh, panel. So we have, we have cap and trade that gives us some money. We have bonds. We, we, we tax ourselves as a, as an, as a s s state and we create money. We're going to be asking our voters to approve a $2 billion bond that is for parks and water. Of that money, 400 million is now designated for adaptation policies. So within a normal flood, flood control and um, uh, park development, we're asking the applicants, the people, the local governments that will apply for that to look at, put their adaptation hat on and uh, come forward with projects that meet, that meet those goals. Um, we've developed a whole suite of uh, projects to provide tax credits or rebates to um, individuals or citizens that live there. We understand that if you want to put a solar system on your house, there is still a federal credit, but, but uh, our low carbon fuel standards, incentives for people to buy electric vehicles, we give them back some money on, um, on the the state level, and we require that some of that money be spent in disadvantaged communities, 25% of it, as specifically is earmarked uh, for that. Um, we did make a, um, credits, I can't read my writing. What is that? Um, I think I, I represent this, the Silicon Valley. I have San Jose and Fremont, where Teslas are made, and I think one of the 
um, elements that the, the world is looking for, since nothing's happening out of Washington, is what can we export? I mean, we realize that all the cell phones that everybody's walking around with, each country did not develop the technology for that cell phone. We, we, it got exported to us and we were able to take advantage of it. So some of, this, some of the uh, projects that we're working on, and one of the reasons why California is here, is not just to tell the California story, but to try to absorb the best practices that other people have. In, in the adaptation arena, we have uh, passed a couple of, uh, of measures that are requiring that, that we reach out to the local communities and provide them with the technical assistance that they have, that they, that they need. Because some of them want to have an adaptation policy, but they don't know what they should do. And there's some money in there to help out the poor communities to adapt it, uh, to uh, come up with a policy, but also to, to use the best practices. We have a website, and everybody's got a website, but we're, we're in 2.0 on our adaptation uh, website. It's the ICARP, I-C-A-R-P. I forget what it stands for. It was my bill, but I still forget what it stands for. But it's, but it's, it's within the Office of Planning and Research, which is here um, uh, with the uh, California delegation, to pull all these resources in. So if we're, doing, if we're talking about forest management, we're talking about sea level rising, we're talking about uh, extreme heat, uh, rodent and infestation of, uh, of uh, uh, not insects, but uh, I've lost it, what I was going to say. Whatever element of the of a, uh, adaptation policy we're going, to, we're going to have, we want to have the best practices for folks to do that um, and the information that's available so we can provide technical assistance. One of the things that we haven't done in, in our cap and trade program, we've had a big discussion with our environmental justice community this past year on um, and how we what we do with the resources that we get. And under our current cap and trade program, eight percent of uh, the funds that or the offsets can be used outside of California to be invested in um, a project. And there's a big outcry from poor groups. Or, disadvantaged communities in our in the state that they want that money spent in California. Now I'm talking to an international group right now and we can say 8% of 1.5 billion dollars is like 120 million dollars. It's not that much money, but that would do a lot in some of the island nations, some of the really poorest countries that could get those resources that that it would mean something. So I guess the takeaway here is that I want to have that discussion with my colleagues in California. I mean, if Sweden can come up with 3.8 Swedish crowns, there's the we're not thinking as internationalists. We're we're called upon it now as subnationals, and we've got the governor talking about the M, under two MOU. But you have to put your money where your mouth is. And again, we have we have disadvantaged communities in California, but there's a a, a larger call for for folks. The other place, the other financing that we do, or, uh, that we need to do a better job at, is on weatherization of our um, our commercial buildings and, and houses. We provide some incentives to folks, but we haven't been able to work out some product with the banks that would um, uh, see more investment up from the private side. We've got a lot of private companies that are here. We're, we have to as we create public policy, we have to develop uh, elements that make it, that incentivizes it. Incentivizes it. Um, the Green Climate Fund, uh, again, I think that the discussion, it's, it would be beneficial for California, even if it was a small amount of money, a relatively small amount of money, but to, to send out the message to other subnationals that we are actually making direct contributions that California, that the United States may not be doing, at least until the United States has a different administration to meet our uh, international obligations. Thank you very much. As I introduced, I think, uh, he has demonstrated what I have just said because of the um, actions that are taken by uh, California at that level. 
at the decentralized level. I think this is important and it's good news for us that uh, a certain percentage of your excess can be used outside of California. And this is important thing that we can capture and see how best this can be utilized. Thank you very much for that uh, insight. And the third panelist uh, that we have is from the European Union region called Francisco Pelgaro, the president Pel Pelgaro, yes, the president of uh, Sardinia from Italy. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for first of all for inviting me to this very interesting panel. Um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm the president of the region of Sardinia. Maybe I, I, Sardinia. I should remember that Sardinia is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Sometimes people get very confused about Sardinia. It's not Sicily, it's an other island. But the key thing is that we are very much in the middle of the Mediterranean, which means that we are kind of potentially a bridge between the two shores of the Mediterranean. So it's a very interesting position, uh, especially uh, in these times of, the, of, our, of our century. And I'm also talking um, as a representative of the committee a European Committee of the Regions, which is, uh, I think, an important institution, European institution, is formed of 350 representatives of uh, European uh, regions and municipalities. All of us are elected people, and we are there. Uh, we go sometimes in Brussels to chat among ourselves, to um, especially uh, to uh, share uh, best practice, practices, which is a very important task, and but also we are there in Brussels to uh, make the European Commission, the government of Europe, to be aware of how important it is to design policies with the advice of local authorities. So this is a big body of local authorities, and we are doing a lot of lobbying, positive lobbying, to uh, make uh, local authorities uh, uh, heard by the higher levels of this multi-level government which we have in, in, in Europe. Um, so again, since we are talking about um, since we are talking about climate change, of course it's extremely important to remember it's a perfect example in which we have to, be, to make everybody aware that uh, the local level is crucial. There is nothing you can do to fight uh, climate change if you don't have very active local authorities, very active territories, because the real action, or as we say, 70% of the real action is at the local level. So that's extremely important. And I think this is a problem uh, of the developing countries, but also the developed countries. We have the same problem, so we can share thoughts and possible uh, solutions. As for the money, of course, there are probably, uh, I'm not sure that in, in Europe the problem is, is really uh, money. It's always a problem, but maybe it's not the main problem. 20% of the EU budget will be invest, invested in climate action by 2020, and 25% of uh, European Investment Bank uh, of the investment will go to uh, fund uh, climate action action. So there is some money. The problem is how can we spend the money and especially how can we create a situation in which the money reach everybody, reach also the weaker communities, the territories which are not in the real north where everything works well, but we really need to put the money where it matters, which often is where it's more difficult to, to reach to get there. So um, one point that I would like to underline that in Europe and we have obstacles for small communities to uh, take the opportunity of uh, using uh, the large amount of money that we are uh, programming. And the problem is that small communities often have insufficient administrative capacities and technical knowledge. Uh, that budgetary and uh, regulatory constraints are difficult to overcome. Uh, there is limited bankability and paybacks of potential investments, and so on. So there are a lot of problems. Um, and these problems are a real problem, because nobody should be left behind in front of the opportunities we have to fight 
climate change. Uh, there are solutions, and I will quote only two, uh, two cases. Uh, one is, I think, is a very interesting one. Um, I'm talking about cross-border cooperation. As I was saying, Sardinia is in the middle of the Mediterranean, and being in the middle of the Mediterranean, we have a um, program which is funded by the European Union, which is called uh, ENI, which is, um, uh, as I said, a cro uh, cross-border cooperation in the Mediterranean region, uh, and we have the managing authority of this EU-funded program from cooperation since 2007. I'm talking about 200 million of euros, so quite not very small program. It's not a huge program, but it's, it's a very interesting program. And the most interesting thing is that um, this initiative involves 14 countries and over 130 regions bordering the Mediterranean. Um, and it, and it also can, this money, of course, can be, can be, can be invested in to, to fund projects which deal with climate change. It's an interesting thing that uh, the program makes institutions for the southern countries, countries of the southern shores of the Mediterranean, to work closely with other regions, um, having regions that have stronger planning capacity and experiences. So there is a lot of real cooperation. Cooperation, which means sharing knowledge, sharing technical capabilities, and, and sharing the future, of course. And there is not one single money that can be spent unless uh, there is a partner for the southern shore. The other thing I wanted to, to show, to, um, to quote, is that we have this beautiful experience with um, municipalities, is a component of mayors, which again is a great moment in which uh, good experiences can be exchanged and, and, and experience can be spread. So one point I want, what would like to say, again, to allow small communities to participate, we have to aggregate them, to uh, have a way of aggregating municipalities so they can reach the critical mass to enter the private sector, to ask for uh, private funding and to be visible and to be able to do, uh, uh, to do a project. We have to scale up in a sense. And for example, a regional authority can help small municipality of our own region to uh, aggregate and to, to do this important uh, uh, preliminary condition in order to be able to uh, to be the candidate for support even from the from the from the private sector. I think these are two lessons which are useful for us in the north, but are very useful for everybody. So, uh, thank you again for this opportunity. I think these opportunities are extremely important. <laughs> Learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Francisco. I think you have highlighted very important uh, issues. Um, for instance, you look at the sizes of some of the councils. They may be small enough and uh, they may not have the technical ability and capacity to access some of the funding, so, but aggregating them, putting them together, and put a common front to a particular donor that can go a long way uh, in, in ameliorating their, their problems. The other issue that you, you talk about is cooperation. And this cooperation is not only at a local level, but this, this should be upscaled to, you have international cooperation, regional cooperation, and bilateral cooperation. And these, these lev different levels of cooperation will help a lot in mitigating and adaptation processes. Because we all know environmental issues, problems, they do not know borders. If I do my own and there is an action that needs to be done, you know, it, it, can, it can move from one region to the other, from one state to the other. So that, that cooperation at international, regional, and national level is very important. So thank you very much. I now have the pleasure to call the fourth speaker uh, of the, f the, the first two of the Kenyan representative of Devolved Climate Finance Alliance, Peter, Peter uh, of the National Treasury, the government of the uh, Kenya. 
uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. The, the name is very difficult. The other one. <laughs> <laughs> the name is very difficult. The other one, but uh, yeah. Yeah. getting money is more difficult than the name. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, indeed, it really give me a great pleasure to share with you, being the only person from the national uh, level here, uh, sub, sub counties and sub national. But nevertheless. Uh, Kenya has got uh, a practical experience on how should we get climate finance reaching the most vulnerable people, the community. As already alluded by the first speaker, it is about the livelihood and how do we make the livelihood of the people, the last person in the ladder, be resilient from the impact of climate change. But of course, uh, Kenya has walked a long way, and uh, our constitution provides two levels of government. And these two levels of government, we have uh, the national government and the county government. And our role as the national government is simply to set up a, long t a short, medium, and long-term policy agenda landscape that will enable the participants, part uh, the key players, especially our county governments, to play and deliver the results, this money, to the people that need it. It makes our role difficult because we need to link with the international community. Climate is a global agenda. Then it comes to the regional agenda. Then it comes to the national. And then the action now happens at the county or sub-county levels. So, but what have we done on this? We know that for the climate finance to flow, you need clear strategic action plans which we started developing far away over 10 years ago. National Climate Change Action Plan for Kenya is a masterpiece that is, uh, has been leading the ground in directing how we can move on that. But action plans alone are not a pinnacle in, them, uh, in themselves. We need policy directives that ensure that other key players which are having the resources, because more than 70% of the climate finance come from the private sector. The public sector money is only about 30%, and it is not enough. And the requirement for about three, over, one, over 1 trillion US dollars needed a year for the next 20 to 30 years to mitigate the impacts of climate change if we have to go below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So what we have done, apart from the National Climate, Fund, uh, Cli National climate Change Action Plan, we moved ahead to develop National Climate Change Act which is now one year ago, which provides for the National Council at the top. And then from there now, we have to have policies. We have a National Climate uh, Finance Policy that now directs how this money is mobilized by the National Treasury where we are, because that is where the public money is being collected. But it needs support from the other various sources, the private sector. So once we get that one into the, into the perspective, mobilize, then we deliver it to the county. But of course, <coughs> It is not just that we have to show by action that we are also putting the money. We are moving on and putting, setting up National Climate Change Fund. And this is a universal fund which definitely will be able to uh, attract more resources into this fund to enable us act in scale. And of course, uh, well, like again, the National Treasury is also the national designated authority for Green Climate Fund. So for this, to act, we are also moving, working very closely with our line ministries, which are the custodian of the technical uh, sectoral policies. And from these resources from the Green Climate Fund, now we are working on national adaptation plans, which are the key for making our communities and our infrastructure resilient on that. So definitely, I concur that it is not an easy uh, game, but challenges are there. We, at the national level, we cannot but pretend to be at the village level. So we have actors from the county government, then we have the civil society organization, and we have the private sector organization. We put them together in what we call interministerial technical committee, and all these policies are derived and worked on by the whole team, so that the issue of capacity doesn't arise. You also need the community also to contribute at that policy level, at the bottom of the pyramid so that they understand and they can act, they can observe, and the scale now is being solved by the 
county governments because they are having technical people at that level. So once we devolve the funds and once we mobilize it and take it down, then there is also what is called the tracking and ensuring that the money which is mobilized, both from the public and the private sector, is transparently delivered to cushion or to build the resilience of the peasant farmer, the peasant livestock keeper, or a fisherman in the village. And once those fishermen and the farmers and the cows are not affected by the impact of climate change, then we are sure that definitely climate finance is reaching those who need it. But the details on how they do it at the county level, I will leave it to my colleagues so that because they have more experience than us at the national level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, as I said, I do not want to recap all what you said, but I have now given the button to um, the other representative from the Devolved Climate Finance Alliance, Professor Kibuta Kibuana, the governor of um, Makueni. Thank you. Uh, thank you very <coughs> much, Chair, fellow panelists, and uh, the forum. Uh, uh, I'm a governor of a county. We are 47 counties in Kenya, and I'm uh, from Makweni. And uh, with me here also, uh, we have two governors, including the chair of all the 47 uh, governors, and I'm sure they'll have opportunity uh, later to uh, say uh, something. Uh, on Sunday uh, in Makweni, we, we had floods, uh, flash floods, uh, which destroyed some bridge. And as a result, in the main artery of the country, uh, there the transport uh, uh, was stopped. And uh, so you can imagine the kind of um, uh, damage uh, that causes uh, to the uh, economy. Uh, and that's just an example of uh, in a Nassau uh, county of uh, some of the uh, problems associated with the uh, the climate change uh, issues. Uh, I was a former minister for uh, environment in my country, and 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 also had the privilege of uh, being the president of uh, uh, the COP at Nairobi, uh, year two thousand and six. So when I came into the governorship, I was very much aware of. Uh, uh, this issue of climate change uh, and this was 2013 when I became governor and uh, we were able to ask uh, partners uh, from the civil society uh, from the international community uh, to come and work with us uh, uh, IED, David, ADA, Christian Aid, Anglican Development uh, Organization and initially the intention was uh, so that uh, this issue would be mainstreamed into our society so that people would understand. Uh, in previous conversations here, it has been stated that uh, there are deniers of the climate change issue at a global level, but even in the communities, there are also people who believe that this is an act of God, uh, sometimes even witchcraft and things like that. So I think the first phase was to really uh, get this agenda mainstreamed at a very grassroots level. And so there was a phase of education and uh, 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 Bonaya, who is here, and others uh, may also say something about this because we collaborated with them. And then um, we were able to say that to really effectively work on this at our level, we needed a legal instrument. And I, I must say, uh, we uh, did a legal, a legal instrument before the national government, because ours was in 2015, and the national government instrument uh, came uh, 2016. But of course, because of the long processes of uh, developing the national one, we had read some of the uh, material uh, before we did uh, uh, ours. And so we came up with an institutional structure uh, you know, from, from a board, from a steering committee, uh, up to uh, the ward level, and we have 30 wards, because we believe that uh, ultimately it is at the very grassroots level where 
uh, uh, climate change investments uh, will be made. Uh, these proposals, proposals will come through. And therefore, uh, it was important to ensure that at the very grassroots level, that's where the major activity uh, uh, happens. And uh, in that institutional uh, structure, we made sure that youth, women, persons with disability, professionals, and also business were uh, accommodated so that we can develop that uh, rainbow uh, uh, alliance. Uh, also in our planning processes, because we have something we call Vision 2025, as well as the CIDPs, uh, we mainstream climate change uh, uh, in, in those uh, policy uh, documents. And uh, we decided that we were going to dedicate, as a state secretary uh, 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 from Sweden, as, as, as to the meeting, dedicate at least 1% of our development budget uh, to uh, climate change issues as a standalone, uh, as a standalone uh, budget. But also, we insisted that every ministry, and we have 10 ministries, must dedicate funds uh, to climate change. And we had the Ministry of uh, uh, Climate Change also dealing with water uh, issues. So that now, all the ministries, uh, when we budget and during their work, they must uh, address this issue apart from the 1% which is now uh, dedicated to special uh, climate change uh, 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 projects. So uh, uh, as, as, as a county, of course, we are also working with, uh, with, with Ascent, with uh, uh, ECRAF and other uh, uh, actors to be able to access the, 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 the Green Climate uh, Change Fund. Uh, uh, that is not an easy process uh, for subnational governments uh, because they cannot directly uh, access those funds. They have to access them through an intermediary. Uh, maybe now the process is being uh, shortened, uh, and that's something that maybe there will be more discussion so that it's uh, easier uh, to access those funds, particularly when it is demonstrated that uh, they are being used uh, in an appropriate uh, in an appropriate manner. In our legislation, we have accountability, uh, uh, we have accountability issues, and uh, since I have to finish, uh, even within all our county, uh, all our counties, uh, we have a body, county, uh, county of, uh, Council of Governors, and here we, had, we have decided that we shall meet all of us together and we shall uh, uh, ensure that uh, we have a robust climate change agenda in partnership with the national government. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting insight. Um, I now call on our last panelist, um, Mr. William Kostka, Director of Micronesia Conservation Trust from the Ozinia region. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to come and share my story with you tonight. Um, as I sit up here, I realize that I'm in the wrong panel because the Micronesia Conservation Trust actually covers uh, three countries. <laughs> so I'm not the subnational organization, but I am um, we are a non-government organization, and we do act uh, very much as a community uh, support service organization. So we are on the ground. Um, the Micronesia Conservation Trust is an accredited entity to both the Adaptation Fund and the, uh, recently the Green uh, Climate Fund. We've been around since 2002. Uh, receiving money from all over the world, uh, including U.S. Uh, government support, uh, private foundations, um, multilateral agencies like the Jeff and, and other organizations. There's 10 staff that work for the organization, so we're a very small organization that's able to get um, grants in and out very fairly quickly. 
Uh, our annual grant making is about two and a half million dollars per year, uh, and we do manage an endowment of about 20 million dollars. Now, um, we have a model. Um, we strive to be world class, but we'd like to remain deeply Micronesian. And we say this because when we say we strive to be world class, is we strive to be able to be accredited to organizations like the GCF and the Adaptation Fund. But our processes, once we receive the money, have to be deeply Micronesian in the sense that when we uh, re-grant or on-grant, uh, that we make them very simple and very accessible to the communities. Uh, I live in a community myself in a village called Awak, so I understand uh, what the communities need and all the other staff that we have also live in the villages. We have built networks across Micronesia so that we are able to get grants out fairly quickly and into the communities to support uh, their work. We are at the front line of the fight against climate uh, change and its impacts. We understand the people and the practical solutions that are best suited for the most vulnerable communities. We are a permanent feature in the community and we are accessible to the local communities with our simple processes in place to allow them to come in to our office and to be, uh, feel comfortable uh, meeting with us. We are also very flexible and as I said, we can make adjustments where necessary very quickly to uh, um, be able to support the local organizations. Um, we also serve as a backstop. Uh, when we, um, just earlier this year, we were about to receive a USAID funding uh, for half a million, uh, $500,000. And when we found that the, uh, they were inflexible on their uh, reporting requirements and that we were going to be uh, forced to pass those reporting requirements to the local communities, we tried to negotiate with them. They wouldn't budge. So we said, we're sorry, we're not going to allow the communities to get this money because we are not going to be able to meet your requirements and we don't want to put those types of requirements on the community. So uh, we also understand the absorption capacity or the lim limitations in absorption at the local level and we make sure that the programs that we bring in are long-term programs that are able to make sure that we are dealing with the absorption capacity because the worst thing you can do is give money to a group or an amount of money to a group that's not ready to receive the money and not ready to uh, actually perform on the ground. It's easy to give away money uh, if you're not interested in making a difference. It's not easy to give away money when you really want sound programs that support uh, those local communities that need it. So I come to you to say that we are uh, in Micronesia and we are looking for partnerships uh, to be able to uh, work with you uh, and to bring those resources back home, not just financial resources, but we are always looking to learn uh, from the uh, different regions and what they're doing best uh, and what they've done uh, that probably didn't work so that we don't make those same mistakes. I'm sorry that I sound like I'm uh, boasting about our work or showing off uh, to you, but I'm just trying to um, state the facts about our organization and our region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, lady and gentlemen. I think we've all heard from our distinguished panelists from all corners of the world, our experiences, both at national and local levels. Now, this brings us to the next agenda of our meeting, that is to allow questions 
and answers. But um, I would uh, caution that because of time, let us be very brief in our questions. And uh, when we respond, we also be very brief because time is not on our side. Yeah. So we, you just announce yourself, your name, where you're coming from, and which organizations you're representing. Thank you. My name is Todd Eisenstadt. I come from American University in Washington, and I'm very proud to say that the U.S. is here in the higher education and NGO community, as well as subnational governments. And I do have a question, I think, which will start with the Kenyan delegation, uh, national and subnational, but also for others. It seems that at the local level, uh, that it is <coughs> easy Thanks. to offer funds for uh, extreme weather event uh, recovery and other, other forms of funding that could be considered mitigation, yet at the same time, adaptation planning at the local level may be very abstract and find uh, difficulty in getting as direct acceptance, especially if there are, as was mentioned, some doubters of climate change and issues relating to the broad concept of climate change. My simple question, I guess, is how do, you, how do you convey and depict these projects to make sure that they maximize local support for them? And how do you get abstract types of planning for adaptation accepted at the local level? And is that more difficult? Thank you. OK, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, before going further with our questions, I at this juncture, would we like to invite the other governor from Kenya, if he has anything to say, to also give his perspective. Yes, Mike. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Josper Nanok. I am the governor for a very arid uh, and semi-arid county called Trukana, but I also chair the Council of Governors of Kenya. Wow. Indeed, what my colleague has presented is basically what is happening all across the, the subnational governments uh, in the country, in our country. Uh, what I want to add is that uh, we have a forum that uh, discusses issues of common interest across the 47 uh, subnational governments and indeed uh, we are taking uh, climate change as a priority agenda to discuss and make sure that it's mainstream but also to negotiate with uh, the national level for more resources to be allocated on top of the resources which we the, the governments themselves the subnational government themselves are going to allocate we just finished elections in Kenya uh, all the subnational governments are in place, uh, including the governors, and we are now on finalizing on our development plans for the next five years. So indeed, it is coming at the very right time that uh, we will now uh, mainstream uh, a climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation issues onto this, and then develop strategies and begin first with the resources that we have. I think it will be right for us to begin with those resources as we look for extra resources in certain areas where we have deficits. Uh, we are glad we're not like California. We work very closely with the national <laughs> government and, uh, uh, with good political will, both from the national and the county. So we are able to deliver programs uh, as one program because uh, we will respond to policies made at national but it is our work to translate those policies into strategic actions that are implementable. Of course, I know it's going to be a very big challenge, particularly for fragile areas, to do adaptation programs. And I think uh, we need to, do, to look at that area much more so that we can develop programs that communities on the ground can be able to, to, to recognize them and agree with them and be able to sustain them. For instance, in an area where I am, most communities are pastoralists, and this is a very fragile environment that is having droughts every two years. And when the rain comes, the rain you should have received in 60 days, you receive it in two days. So, 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 so you can imagine 
the kind of adaptation we may need to move into. If you tell a local Turkana pastoralist to move and do ranching, where you can grow grass, you can have water near, it may take you a very long time to convince that person to change the way they have been moving from place to place. But of course, that's an investment we must put in to have a dialogue with communities on ways of how they can be able to adapt to the new changes in uh, extreme changes in climate. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. My name is Ali Ibrahim Roba, Governor of Mandera County, is one of the also the ASAL areas. I think over and above what uh, my colleagues from uh, the National and uh, Professor Kibwana have shared, and what uh, the Chairman uh, for Council of Governors, the umbrella body that uh, brings together the county government, have shared. I just want to share uh, one specific issue. First, the challenge that uh, uh, the challenge of climate change, uh, whether one country does extremely well, the impact will not be felt unless globally we are all collectively doing something together. And if that is the case, uh, from this, uh, attending this conference, and we've been discussing with my colleagues, there's need for radical approach, uh, radical redesign of the way we've gone about it. Uh, this is uh, uh, looking at issues of behavioral change from kindergartens moving upwards to university in order to make sure that we have a, a, you know, a behavioral change that we instill so that generations ahead will be able to view things in a more simplistic way rather than what maybe President so-and-so or Governor so-and-so may view it as in favor at that point or not in favor. And that will require probably, you know, curriculum related issues that will be able to be at lower level and gradually cascaded to university level. And this is uh, the program we are looking at. It's not all the time that we'll have a willing president and willing county governments working together. Uh, now in uh, Kenya, we are privileged to have a willing national government and willing county government working together. Uh, your situation is not very unique, um, Honorable Senator. Uh, I believe there are many challenges across the globe with similar issues where maybe units at sub-level are doing very well and units at, I mean, the national level have difficulties doing it. Bravo to your governor. He touched uh, many in terms of the presentation he has made. That is the spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone? Any other question? Yeah, I'm Joydeep Gupta. I'm a journalist based in India. I have a question for the representatives from both Kenya and Tanzania. Anyone of them would like, if they want to answer. Uh, how exactly uh, have you changed your climate adaptation plans due to the long-term droughts that are going on in both, both your countries? What have been the exact changes in your plans? And we allow the panelists to, to respond. Thank you. I'm, I'm Frederick Ouma, and I'm interested in uh, Senator Bob's opinion in terms of how do we create uh, a financial uh, regime that is more grant-based as opposed to loan-based, especially when we are getting into the, the barrier agreement regime. And uh, how then do we also come up with simpli uh, simplified procedures of access to some of these funds to facilitate local communities or local based organizations to implement adaptation and mitigation projects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Anna Kinyanda from uh, Tanzania. I'm working with the uh, Minister of uh, Regional Administration and Local Government, which is under the minister, uh, which is under our President's office. Uh, Chair, uh, 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 mine is uh, additional for the presentation from Dr. Lucy on the uh, issue of decentralized climate finance uh, mechanism for the case of Tanzania. 
Uh, just the addition, uh, uh, now what we are doing now, we have, uh, we, we have started with three uh, districts as, uh, a pilot, as pilot in the northern part of Tanzania to, uh, 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 to, to intervene the, the climate uh, change issues. And uh, now, uh, through the lesson that we have learned so far, uh, the experience that we have experienced for these three pilot districts, we are going to scale up for the 12 more uh, districts, uh, of which we are going to have 15 uh, uh, districts in, in our country, which is around 8%. Eight, eight and again, uh, 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 we are in the process, as uh, Dr. Luz said, that uh, we are in the process of, of uh, being accredited for the GCF so that we scale up the the, the 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 interventions for the for the for the for the whole uh, country but chair uh, the based on this uh, since we started this uh, 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 process uh, or this mechanism uh, we uh, what we had in in our country we have uh, uh, four levels of the government system we have the national regional and also districts and the, as well as the lower levels but we don't have actually the budget line specifically addressing the issue of uh, intervention of the climate change. Uh, and now, uh, through this, we have already uh, secured the so-called the, the, yeah, the so the, 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 the subcode from the Minister of Finance, so that, that, so that now the issue of climate change is not can be have their own budget line, so that we, we can, we, it's easy to track the funds that are elected to the uh, climate change intervention at the lower levels. That's all that I would like to share, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we just, I thought that was a question, but it was a comment. So we'll have one more question and then allow the panelists to respond. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Musa Epsau. Um, I'm the president of a farmer network in my country, the Gambia. Uh, basically, I uh, have been listening to all the different discussions. Uh, basically, my entire question would be centered on my brothers uh, from Ethiopia. Um, when the other government mentioned that um, in his own, own county, um, there is a, you know, um, an erratic rainfall or some kind of drought, um, sometimes they will talk to the communities, uh, particularly the, the, the hard men, to, 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 to engage more into transhuman uh, kind of, uh, of movement. Uh, I believe that in climate uh, resilience, uh, we need to look at uh, the adoption aspect has to really uh, cater for um, the livestock. In that, I think, um, since he said also that uh, a rain that is supposed to last for two months probably will only go for two, two weeks. Why couldn't they, as part of the uh, uh, adaptation strategy to introduce uh, um, water uh, harvesting, knowing that you have gotten, uh, you will only probably get rain for one, one, uh, one to, uh, or two weeks. Why you couldn't do, um, in a, as a strategy in responding to that, you introduce uh, water harvesting. And secondly, again, is that um, I think uh, we, we as African basically should not, should move away from rain-fed agriculture and also engage in, in irrigation aspects. That is, you use your irrigation in such a way that, uh, like, if the rain is coming, probably, you know, during that time, you don't need to use your irrigation. You only need to use irrigation if there's, if it happens that it goes for one or two weeks without rain, you can irrigate your land for a week or so, or two weeks, until the time that you, you see the next rain. Otherwise, uh, not only the animals are going to be affected, but finally, even the food security that, uh, that we, we think we can could we can we can get or reach would become a, a quite a big challenge. I basically think uh, that a strategy, a rotation strategy, the water harvesting and irrigation must be promoted. And thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I would allow the Dr. Lucy to respond to the questions directed to her. Uh, thank you very much. I got uh, one question. And this was uh, on how we have changed our adaptation plans with the current uh, uh, ongoing events of floods and uh, drought. Uh, in Tanzania, we are currently finalizing our NAPs, but we have put more emphasis on uh, uh, climate proofing infrastructures and making sure that the new infrastructure or the ones which are being rehabilitated have the element of proofing for climate change uh, impacts. Also, we have uh, emphasized on water use efficiency technologies, including water harvesting and use of uh, cropping systems that 
uh, allows uh, minimum use of water, but of, above all, we are advocating and upscaling climate smart agriculture practices and technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now allow the senator. If I were so clever to come up with a way to simplify the flow of funds to local governments, that would be great. I, I think an element that that would facilitate that is for the subnationals for the states to have uh, clear goals of what they want to achieve. One of the one of the uh, al tools that we use is to have a pilot project or to have uh, experimental. We, in my area, I'm in the Bay Area. We have an experimental wetland uh, restoration that we're using. Uh, waste treatment to, to put on it to to see how we can restore wetlands for you know the for these extreme weather events I think a pilot program in a, a deforested area we have wildfires there's wildfires all over the, the world um, but look at some get the best science that's available from the universities in Kenya or Tanzania and and University of Berkeley and and have the the folks that understand this, look at the, the experiment to see if this would be, for instance, the way that we would want to reforest, um, or what, what has worked, and, and how do we tweak that, and, and have those funds available for that, so that, that it could be part of our best practice community in the world. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, Peter? Uh, thank you very much. I will, there are two questions. I will take the second one, and the first one I will leave for my governor. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, how have we strengthened our adaptation plans? In Kenya, as you are aware, that adaptation plans have been in the development for a very short period, and uh, it is true that adaptation, how to plan for adaptation has been a challenge, because of lack of information science and technology has not been forthcoming as compared to mitigation in the, in the process. What have we done? We have strengthened the systems for the early warning system which is provided for our meteorological systems and as you're aware that Kenya is the first county to use extensively the mobile systems, mobile money. Through that system, there are also now applications which are readily to provide farmers with information on the type of the early warning system. So that has made some of the communities a little bit more resilient. And of course, also within the investment, within the infrastructure uh, uh, development and the design, that is where now the climate financing, that the building, the, the, we call it the CA factor, where over and above the normal threshold for the engineering design that has now been able to be factored in across and mainstreamed within the planning system so that uh, infrastructure are uh, climate proofed at, at the design. Again, the National Treasury is not behind. Uh, sometimes uh, climate related issues like drought are really unpredictable, but also we have long term data we know. There is a contingency fund that is also uh, in place and uh, we have been having drought, but the last one, if we had no contingency fund to make our adaptation planning better, we would have got much more losses. I indeed, uh, that really helped. But uh, of the same, uh, in, the, in the long term, they are also now uh, divesting into small scale uh, smart irrigation systems, which are, are supposed to large orig originally uh, water flooded systems in the county. So, Quite a lot of things are moving on within the adaptation. It is now our main core. Uh, Kenya is one of the first countries uh, in the world to get adaptation uh, support from the GCF to strengthen, review, and now take the national uh, communities level. And uh, we have been giving that example in so, so we are doing better in that. I, I think in terms of the, the, the same question, uh, uh, Governor Nanok was able to also talk to it. Uh, about whether we are focusing just on mitigation or adaptation and uh, uh, like in the committees that I talked about we have uh, you know technical people who uh, help us in terms of uh, uh, saying which uh, uh, programs we will we will we will focus on and actually the main focus is, is adaptation and uh, uh, for example we are working with the several donors in Makweni 
uh, on that question of water harvesting, uh, and we have something we call a $1 billion initiative, where a lot of uh, development partners, uh, we are in conversation uh, with them, so that each household, we have about 200 households, we uh, are able to harvest water uh, for agriculture, particularly for irrigation. Uh, so this is something that we are uh, we, we are also focusing on, but of course, a lot of technical assistance is required uh, uh, in terms of uh, making sure that we plan uh, well for climate action. Thank you very much. I hope uh, all questions were responded to, and I believe we very close to the end of this uh, important event. And uh, is Paul Usman here? It's not here. Okay. Sorry. Paul Usman is not here. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if any one of you has any last word to say, the floor is open for you to say. Okay. Oh. V very short thing to say. I, I, I heard the magic word, which is technology. I guess technology is a key to, answer, to adaptation in many respects, including the drought. Uh, but uh, we have to remind ourselves that technology I I is a magic word, but not a, an easy thing to, to apply because it requires lots and lots and lots of specific knowledge and specific human capital, a lot of education specific education. So uh, maybe we know in which direction to go, but we have a lot of work to do to make a transfer of knowledge when it is needed to be effective. Otherwise, the risk is that we spend money. We have money. We spend money in technology, but people there are not able to make the most of it. So the human factor is essential when we talk about technology. Thank you. Just my last take is that adaptation is our priority <coughs> and that the money should flow to adaptation. Currently, it is only 3%. And 3%, given with the, ta the number of populations that are affected, of the world population is about 7.6 6 billion. More than 5 billion are affected. Colleagues, we need to change and do not wait for business case to finance adaptation. Adaptation is up, uh, need more money than mitigation. Thank you. Any other? Uh, my take for uh, this uh, event is that uh, it's high time now we take the communities seriously. There are a lot of initiatives that are being undertaken, but uh, very little amounts of money are directed to communities. I think it's high time now we move from uh, big uh, or large investments at national and regional levels and direct funds to the communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this brings us to the end of the panel discussion. And uh, I would like to call on the Director of GCF, Mr. Paus Manjajo, to do the closing remarks. Oh, oh, he's. Okay, some more questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. To say, who me? Okay. Oh, no, I can, I can say something. Um, okay, okay, for him, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I want to share the fact that uh, being one of the, the people who are actually intimately involved in the process of uh, supporting the community when we were piloting the devolved cl climate finance in the five counties in Kenya, what I was able to learn 
um, you know, uh, having money go down to the local level, for many the uh, people may not understand what it means, actually. So um, the experience we've had is that uh, local people, all they need is to know how much money is available to them. They want to be given capacity, and at the same time, if you can provide them with technical support, and the rest of uh, the things will fall in place. Actually, you will we learned that uh, money gets to be directed to the right investment at that point. In the past, it's been a uh, decision being made at that high level, sometimes at national level, and ending up with the wrong investment that doesn't build uh, communities' resilience, but even sometimes going against their resilience. So um, having money uh, shown to the community and giving them powers and authority to decide over those resources will actually change a lot in terms of uh, climate uh, change and addressing the issues of uh, resilience and addressing the issues of, of uh, vulnerability at local level. There are many, many examples of invest investment that were made in the piloting that we undertook that actually demonstrated that communities should be the one to decide over the resources. And I think it's time that we get more and more money down to the people at local level. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Please come. Okay, Mr. Benito. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Benito Muller, professor at Oxford University. I would like to congratulate Senator Vikowski for his uh, initial intervention. Because I've been working with uh, State Senator Barrett from Massachusetts to create the bill, which is the moment in the Massachusetts State Senate, which creates a Massachusetts Least Developed Countries Fund as, a, in a sense, a crowdfunding instrument, a check-off program for the LDCF here at the, under the UN. And I think these sort of things are really innovative and have to be congratulated. And I hope we may be able to do something in California. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, all the panelists for giving us uh, their experiences with regards to climate financing, particularly when it comes to local level climate financing. But few messages came out of this meeting that we all need to take home. And one that is there should be political commitment for us to be able to have the finance necessary required to take the actions to support our local communities. Another key message that comes out of this is that Yes, we have disparities between developed and developing countries. And the capacities of developing countries need to be built at both national level and also at the local level. And also, um, my friend Francisco talked about technology. We are in a digital world. We require this technology, but we are disadvantaged on the other side of the globe because we do not have the resources to have these technologies. So these technologies, not only having access to them, but how do we make them operationalize to the use of our various communities? So I think these are very important messages that come out of this meeting. And uh, hey, I'm sorry, Mr. Pa Usman is here. Oh. <laughs> um, so it is important that we all learn these lessons and, and uh, we pursue. At the international level, we need the commitment of our, international, of our leaders to be able to get these funds and support our national actions to be able to make our communities climate resilient. So on that note, I would like to invite uh, the GCF director, Mr. Pa Usman Jaju, to close this meeting because his, his statement would be very important for most of us here in this room uh, is at GCF. So what is the fund doing to support the least developed countries? Thank you. Thank you, good evening. I'm sorry for keeping you here. 
you know we are working for you so we had a lot of requests for bilateral so we had to stick and meet almost everybody that's why i was late but it's glad to be here uh, we as a fund we're trying to see how we can respond to your needs and one of the fundamental needs that we've realized is how we can move from central to regional. And we have the enhanced direct access uh, uh, facility where you can register as organizations at the local level and access funding. Uh, this, is, this is a new, a new initiative. We, we launched it last year. Some enhanced direct access entities have registered. It's not very successful, but we think it's, it's in a, a pilot stage. So we would see how we can better improve that process. But in terms of direct access to funding to the GCF, we had the board that uh, board decision that told us to improve on the enhanced direct access uh, facility. So as of now, we have accredited 59 entities. Out of these, 37 are direct access entities, and 22 are international uh, access entities. So in terms of really reaching to you, we are improving on that process. The process of expediting uh, the GCF procedure is also being improved as of, of, as of today. We have uh, disbursed almost 160 million out of 600 projects that are being implemented. Uh, the readiness program is here. We have disbursed almost 41.8 million US dollars in terms of really supporting countries to strengthen their capacities at the level of the NDAs. And this is something that uh, could be done on an annual basis, so each country can access up to one million US dollars for readiness. The NAP process is also here. You can access up to three million US dollars for national adaptation planning. Uh, and we have re we received about 38 requests from countries. We have approved 10. We did comment on about 18 proposals that are back to the countries. So we're here for you, and uh, we will do everything to ensure that we meet your desires, but this is, this is a new organization. We are on a learning curve, we are growing. We have uh, the approval of the board to increase our staffing level from 140 now to 250. So we think by next year this time, uh, it would be a different narrative. But what we have seen so far is that we have really progressed compared to where we were last year. Uh, but nonetheless, we are conducting a review of the readiness, uh, pro, pro, uh, readiness support. What we would want is for the NDAs and others to help us come up with suggestions as to how we can improve that. So on this note, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you and then declare this uh, meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that good news. Then we all go home with the good news that the funds are available. You can apply. <laughs>